when we um, talk about the Constitution, constitutional law in the United States, we have to discuss the South. Um, and in particular, one thing we have to do is we have to talk about the South in the context of technology, changing culture, changing law. Uh, one of the things we have to remember about our Constitution is it stands as one of the two great last achievements of the Enlightenment era. Um, it is a constitution that was designed for what is effectively a pre-industrial era by a pre-industrial society. Uh, so we have this constitution that represents the height of Enlightenment thinking based upon the height of an Enlightenment economy as well. Uh, the other achievement, of course, is the British frigate, which has two million moving parts and is an amazing war machine. Uh, but unlike the frigate, the Constitution is not proven to be made obsolete by changing times and changing culture. But to give you a sense of what I'm trying to get at with regard to technological change and how this is going to tie into understanding the South and its relationship to the Constitution, I want you to think for a minute about the pace of the movement of information and the pace of the movement of communication, the pace of the movement of the economy at the end of the 18th century. You were bound by the wind, by the speed of the foot, the speed of the stream, or the speed of the horse. You could move no communication faster than you could move any piece of commerce or any individual. In very quick fashion, we have the steam engine come online as a practical technology in the early 19th century. We have telegraphic communication come online soon after that. By the end of the 19th century, we are projecting ourselves across the continent in days rather than months. We are expanding across the continent, moving our culture and our economies into a variety of areas. We've engaged in expansive war using new industrial technology, both against foreign nations and against ourselves in the American Civil War. We have had a fundamental change in terms of the relationship between man and nature and man and man. The nation changes. It's difficult for the nation to be isolated. At the time of the framing of the Constitution, most individuals, once they went into the frontier, if they did, would not go more than 20 miles from where they homesteaded for the rest of their lives. Most people would live and die within 20 miles of where they were born. Now you look at a country where presently one in three Americans will move every five years to another state or another place. Two thirds of the population does not live within 20 miles of where it was born. So we have these radical changes that arise from technology. But these technological changes, initially in industrialization, make the South strong through technologies that make cotton farming highly profitable, but also in the long run make the South economically and uh, politically vulnerable and ultimately lead to a divergence in the cultures of the North and the South that exacerbate tensions that we institutionalize in the Constitution. The North became rapidly industrial while the South lagged because there was more profit in agriculture than there was in manufacturing. For example, the fifth largest manufacturing city in the South before the Civil War was Columbus, Georgia, which I doubt many of you have even heard of. It's where Fort Benning is. Uh, Columbus today has about 180,000 people, but you go back 150 years, one of the largest industrial centers in, the world, in, in the North America and especially in the South. The South exacerbates sectional crises that lead to constitutional crisis. That's the first thing we have to remember. If we go back to 1776, before the framing of the founding of the Republic, the debate over the Declaration of Independence includes debate over what do we do with slavery? How do we handle the slave issue? Jefferson wanted to move in a very liberal direction. These provisions concerning liberty condemning slavery are struck from the Declaration. When we get to the Constitutional Convention a dozen years later, we find again that we have to deal with compromise to manage the slave issue. And we do a variety of things in the Constitution that create what are effectively Southern advantage in the Constitution. But even with this institutionalization of Southern advantage, we have a series of crises. And they occur with great regularity. In 1811, the Western and Southern states are pitted in conflict against New England over whether or not to make war with Great Britain. In 1820, 1833, and 1850, 
We have crises over how to handle slave state, free state admission to the Union, how to deal with the extension of slavery into new territories captured from Mexico during the Mexican War. We have to deal with the treatment of slave as property in federal law. And these disputes are ongoing, they are constant. A periodic compromise by Henry Clay, led by Henry Clay in particular, puts off conflict. But we have this institutionalized tension that keeps coming to a head. And after the Dred Scott decision, the radical conflict in Kansas, the election of Abraham Lincoln, we ultimately arrive at open war. So what is Southern Advantage? Um, Southern Advantage points to contradictions and ironies in the Constitution. From the Virginians, we get a guarantee of rights and liberties, but we also get the institutional of slave, institutionalization of slavery in the Constitution by omission of discussion of the issues. We defer, we defer ending the slave trade coming into the United States, but we don't talk about whether or not slavery is constitutional, it is merely presumed. We craft legislative bodies that are designed to represent population based on persons, the U.S. House. We apportion power based upon people. We apportion taxes based upon people. But in the process, what we do is we have to deal with the issue of how to deal with people who are assumed to be not citizens. How do we deal with an enslaved African population, which depending upon the southern state is gonna make up anywhere from 25 to 45% of the population at the time of the framing of the Constitution. So we have a three-fifths compromise. We determine that a other person, that is how they are referred to as other persons, shall count as three-fifths of a person for apportioning representation and for taxes. The South, of course, wants slaves to fully count for the purpose of representation, but not for taxes. The North wants the slaves to count for taxes, but not for representation. So this is the compromise, and the other thing we do is we simply don't count the Indians and in 1924, we finally deal with the issue of Indian citizenship, Native American citizenship. This is the high water mark for the South in terms of political power. There are, there are more slave states than free states. There are an equal number of Southern and non-Southern states. The South has a lot of representation in the Senate, uh, excuse me, in the House. It has disproportionate representation because it's based upon the treat is based upon translating population that doesn't have sovereignty, doesn't have a vote, into representation. So in effect, we're taking property and turning it into voting. Now, these issues that uh, task us throughout the first 80 years of the Republic are finally settled on the field of battle, and that's an issue for the Civil War historians to settle. Uh, I should note to you, uh, the conversation we have among Southern politics is who really won the Civil War, and the answer is the Southern historians. Okay. But after that war, the most interesting period of American history occurs that we never deal with, the Reconstruction, which is effectively the reframing of the Constitution. The reframing is an effort to reconstruct Southern advantage, to take away the shrewd skills the South has used in an effort to impose its will on the rest of the country. Uh, as the South lost its balance of power in terms of states, slave states, free states, in the early part of the 19th century, we saw a new institution emerge called the filibuster in the U.S. Senate. We still have it. But much of what happens after the Civil War is an effort to reframe the Constitution to take away Southern advantage and an effort to reconcile cultural difference between the South and the rest of the nation. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment explicitly addresses and overturns the Dred Scott decision by granting citizenship to African Americans, to the freedmen of uh, North America. Dred Scott determined that black person, whether free or slave, was not a citizen and did not have standing to sue. Fourteenth Amendment explicitly runs at this. The Fifteenth Amendment goes further to guarantee voting rights. And then finally, in a Supreme Court case in 1869, U.S. v. Texas, which is oddly enough a case about the disposition of debt bonds held by the state of Texas before the Civil War, the U.S. Supreme Court comes down and says not only could Texas, not only could the people who had bought Texas's debt bonds who attempted to resell them in New York 
sell them. Texas didn't have the right to sell them because the government that sold them was a Confederate government that wasn't legitimate because Texas never really seceded because secession is unconstitutional. So we get the idea of this one permanent, insolvable union being articulated in this court case, and it still stands as precedent, much to the frustration of modern secessionists. Now, this effort at Reconstruction is successful for about a dozen years. We have the election of black officials across the South. We have a great deal of progress in the South, or so we're told. But the point of fact is, the South starts to come undone very quickly as Southerners attempt to seek local advantage. As early as 1868, the effort is made to reimpose the old political order. The state of Georgia, having been readmitted to the Union under Reconstruction, takes steps to immediately expel all the black state legislators from their state legislature, rescinds their ratification of the 14th Amendment, and invites the wrath of the national government, which immediately reimposes martial law, suspends civil government, the newly elected Southern Redeemer Governor of Georgia flees to Canada taking the state treasury with him. Okay. A Republican governor, Rufus Bullock, is put into place. A new legislature is put into place as uh, Alfred Terry, the Union General, purges 18 Redeemer lawmakers from the uh, Georgia legislature, reinstalls the 18 African American state lawmakers. Georgia re-re-ratifies the 14th Amendment. Union troops withdraw, and Reconstruction finally ends in Georgia. Georgia passes a new constitution, which includes a little thing called a poll tax, which serves as one of a variety of vehicles for disfranchising Southern blacks. In South Carolina, open warfare broke out in 1876 between black and white Republican and Democratic militias across the state for control of state government. Two state governments were elected, one sitting in Charleston, a redeemer government attempting to reassert white sovereignty, a loyalist government, a union Republican government in Columbia. A Cold War breaks out with periodic skirmishes in the Low Country, and ultimately the Charleston government wins because they tell everybody, send us 10% of your tax bill for last year and we'll give you basic services. We'll provide basic protection. At the same time, the resolution of the 1877 presidential election with disputed electoral votes leads to the final withdrawal of Southern troops and the inability to enforce Reconstruction. Over the next two decades, Southern states will impose a variety of new constitutions and new laws designed to effectively reassert white sovereignty and white supremacy throughout the South. This period of decline sets in for roughly 70 years. But it only takes about two decades for the federal courts to revisit turning back the most obnoxious of these devices. Uh, in the era of the Lochner Court, 1905 to uh, 1940. The Supreme Court is actually fairly assertive about defending 15th Amendment rights. Um, in a case out of Oklahoma, the gun case, they overturned the grandfather clause as a qualification to vote. So the first major, voting rights, uh, first major voting rights case that overturns a state Jim Crow law occurs in the state of Oklahoma, 1913. And it makes it, it sets the precedent of challenging explicit discriminatory devices. Uh, the same court in the 1920s and 30s will twice strike down the Texas white primary until finally in the 1940s, the court definitively ends the white primary in a 14th Amendment case out of Texas. But still, in this period, it is a very difficult thing to challenge Jim Crow. It's not until really the 1960s that we see the effort to apply the Constitution against Southern advantage and to take on Southern shrewdness. If we go into the Second Reconstruction under the Warren Court, we see litigation against discrimination in public schools. We see litigation over equal representation and rural bias in the uh, allocating of seats in legislatures. Congress and the states pass the 24th Amendment banning the poll tax. And then finally, because we simply cannot succeed the Voting Rights Act is passed in 1965. The problem is a simple one. Uh, Ross Barnett, the governor of Mississippi back in the 1960s, made the observation 
of the federal government's effort to litigate against discriminatory voting laws that a legislature can change laws faster than a court can overturn them. It's as simple as that. In Mississippi, efforts to gain evidence for voting rights cases were frustrated because we discovered, for example, that in 77 of 82 Mississippi counties, when federal agents showed up to collect voting information, the result, the, uh, the voting data had mysteriously burned in a fire. There was evidently an electoral arsonist at work in Mississippi. So dramatic measures are undertaking that suspend state authority to enact their own election laws because the states cannot be trusted in the opinion of the national government to effectively implement in good faith the 14th and 15th Amendment. Um, this sets the stage for the next half century of voting rights litigation and voting rights disputes, and these disputes are still with us to this day. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.